Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to the, the talk. Today we have uh, speaker Rui Lee. She is a PhD candidate in uh, School of Informatics. Her research supervisor is Dr. Paul Petras. Her primary research interests are in uh, millimeter wave mobile networking and resource allocation mechanisms for IEEE A2211. And today she's going to talk about uh, fair airtime allocations for millimeter wave networks. And then can we welcome her, please? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's nice to talk to you today. And um, my name is Ray Lee, as introduction, uh, as int uh, introduced by Aaron. And um, I'm from the School of Informatics. Today I'm going to talk about my research on min maximum fair resource allocation for minimum wave multi-hop networks. So um, we are now living in an era where almost every single of us has at least one mobile device. And in the last <coughs> few years, we have seen that the increasing trend that um, the emerging, uh, with the emerging applications uh, we installed on the mobile devices and we will see this trend going to continue and one thing shared in many of the mobile applications in common is that they consume a lot of data traffic. As predicted by Ericsson, in, in the next five years we will see the mobile data traffic, um, the demand of mobile data traffic increase approximately five folds. So, once, so the, it, it's natu such kind of mobile data traffic demand will d naturally brings a kind of crisis for the existing mobile networks. So one, one thing that the mobile networking industry is pursuing, one approach that they are, pro they, they are pursuing is a kind of densification of deployment in the, of the small cell, of the small, of cellular network and as well as Wi-Fi networks. So more, um, this, this densification idea involves shrinking the cell size, shrinking the p coverage area, whereas deploy more number of base stations or access points in a, in a certain area. This will, this will require for a kind of um, reliable, back, reliable backhauling that, will com that, that, that needs to, com to transfer all the data from the user devices to the internet gateway. And this kind of backhauling, we say, um, is it, it, critical because the down, the, 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 all the data ge generated from the, down, uh, from the user devices is, is massive, so this backhauling needs to be efficient and, and reliable. Why the solutions? Maybe a lot of people would think of to connect these, uh, to connect these base stations and can, can, can work but only for short term. Because of because of cap CapEx, the, the, the cost, of the de of deploying back backhauling networks using f use, using materials such as fiber optics fi fiber optics is going to grow at the network size. So imagine a typical <coughs> deployment scenario in a very center uh, in a kind of um, dense urban area where we see in the map that there are a number of uh, tourists or like just just random users on the street. And each of them having a number of mobile device uh, mobile devices in, in use, and we um, we consider a number of base stations deployed in this area, and the all serving e each of them serving a number of each of them serving a number of uh, of users, whereas also also they will um, kind of relay traffic from from for, for, for each other. So the complexity of deploying backhaul network using fiber optics is going to be complex. Uh, it's going to be complex and imagine the, the kind of deployment will, will always involve kind of asking permission from the city council and actually digging holes in the, in the very busy high street area. Once deployed, this kind of network can, ha can, be, ha can hardly be, recon be reconfigured because this will, it will, this, this will involve another round of maybe um, is, uh, constructions. Why the solutions, um, uh, though considered so far, has been mostly concentrated on the, uh, using the uh, using the microwave uh, technology, such as those um, two and five gigahertz frequencies. So we, the free, the problem with these frequency bands is that they are they are um, ha they have very limited ban bandwidth. And they are already overcrowded with the application that we see nowadays: microwaves, baby monitors, and sometimes cordless phones. Every now and then, um, 
So hence, military wave now become very promising. It has it, it opens up significant opportunities for back back holding solutions, basically because it has a really massive volume of bandwidth available mm -hmm. and is currently underutilized. So a good thing about it is, it is also that some portion of these uh, some portion of these frequencies are even bandwidth uh, are even uh, license exempt in some part of the world. For example, mm -hmm. six gigahertz frequencies. It has like seven gigahertz wide spectrum, and each of the channel can can be as much as two gigahertz. It allows for massive um, rate of transmissions and. But the problem could be that the signal attenuates as a physical characteristic decided um, that the, the, the propagation can like experience severe attenuation. To tackle this problem, fortunately, we have the um, technology to beam to do kind of very narrow beam, um, very narrow um, beam training and beam, beam forming technology that allows for high gain and highly directional transmissions between minimal wave transceivers. And this is a gra uh, this is a figure, um, a picture of the commercial device called uh, commercial device from Velocity, which is equipped with the six gigahertz trans uh, antenna transceivers. So with this kind of um, beam forming technology, we have um, the attenuation signal attenuation greatly tackled. But uh, and also um, with this kind of directional um, fashion of transmissions, the interference experienced by the traditional frequencies and, and the traditional kind of broadcast, broad, broadcasting type of channel is greatly mitigated as well. Mm -hmm. So we have very um, we in in the previous re research, people have already carried out some measurement, and uh, there is a result showing that. Transmissions using these highly directional antennas can be assumed as as um, as pseudo wired as as, as direct link link transmissions. So this also allows for good spatial reuse, meaning that non interfering links can be active at the same time, which um, presumably will increase um, uh, increase the network efficiency as well. But the new challenge com com comes to with the directional antennas to the terminal deafness. I want to use this very simple example to show you what terminal deafness means. And um, imagine three base stations all equipped with um, minimum wave directional and, um, transceivers, and one and three are carrying out communication between each other. So they are kind of one is transmitting and one is uh, with the receiving, with their beam aligned with with each other. Now, if a station two want to join the communication, or maybe just Forward some packets to station three based on the routing or based on the routing, routing protocols. It might not work because three doesn't have its beam aligned with two, so two won't be succeed in, in its transmission attempt. So um, we have this 1180 standard that um, briefly touched on this uh, this terminal terminal deafness problem, but not very specifically. We have the uh, this this standard specifies the MAC and uh, Phi, um, MAC and Phi protocols, and it uh, specifies the service period kind of access, which means dedicated um, transmission time between two stations, um, the kind the, the kind of this service period access paradigm, but it left open for how long this each service period should be and when and how to allocate this service period when a single station has multiple multiple neighborhoods. And this could become a more complex problem when we move on to multi-home networks where um, backhaul is one of the is one of the um, scenario. <coughs> then <coughs> have briefly touched on many of these, but I want to briefly summarize and the key challenges to leverage or to exploit the maximum uh, the, the minimal wave now uh, minimal wave technology in multi hub backholings. So first of all, we want to overcome the terminal deafness problem so that each station know when to talk to whom, and we want to allocate airtime so that a base station will know how long to beam switch to which uh, to to um, to which neighbor. And we want to um, kind of achieve kind of um, cooperated or coordinated fashion of transmission network wide, so that there's no confliction between the uh, there's no confliction between transmissions. Whereas we also allow concurrent transmissions to improve the efficiency. 
Hence, we propose our, um, the proposed algorithm called YHO, where we based on the 11AD protocol, but we move on to specify how the, this service period should be allocated and how to distribute it in the backhaul networks. And we want to achieve a kind of maximum fair resource allocation between flows, and I will tell you why. So there are other finer strategies or just um, resource allocation strategies such as max throughput where you want to achieve the maximum sum of throughput in the network. But this, I wouldn't say it's, it's, it's um, it, uh, I wouldn't say that it's fair in the network because with, minimum, uh, with, with, minimum, with a number of minimum wave links in the network, we, all, we, we often have various link rates and with, ma with max throughput, some flows traversing those links with inferior link rates could be easily stuffed because this, the, because this kind of strategy will f in favor of, of achieving the highest throughput um, in the network wise um, as, as a sum. So the, the, other, the other strategy called round robin is to allocate the resource equally to all the flows in the network. But this will, 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 generate, will, will result in some wastage when there is some, uh, when some of the flow has a good link whereas some others don't. The good links will be, will be wasting some of the airtime if they do. So if they, do, if, if they receive the equal airtime as, as, as other flows who are, trans who, who are um, traversing the kind of um, poor links. So max mean fair here, I mean that to maximize the number of um, the amount of resource to the re flows with minimum demand or minimum constraint. So the, here the goal is really to balance between the total throughput and the intraflow fairness. And I want to ensure all the users that with, that with minimum constraint or minimum demand will be satisfied first and then, re and then the rest of the resource will be allocated equally to the, to the, to the flows with better resources. So um, I'll briefly walk through two questions mainly. One is how to allocate airtime, and once we obtain the airtime, how would we distribute it in, in the um, envisioned now uh, small cell backhaul networks? A simple example is um, with six space stations and uh, three and three, uh, three, uh, six space stations. They are con connecting with each, with each other using the minimum wave links. And one of them, station six, is ha has a wired link to the gateway. And I want to. Uh, and each of the base stations is, of, of course, serving a number of um, uh, a number of devices, as shown for the station one. And there, I want to introduce this aggregated flow terminal uh, notion, which means um, aggregate the sum of all the flows that generated or consumed by, the, um, by all the devices connected to a single base station. So we have three aggregated flow on this graph. One is flow, uh, flow one, two, and three. They, are, they, are the traf they represent the traffic from, uh, from base station one, two, and five. So here we, we are kind of in investigating or explaining things based on this very simple three flow, um, up, uh, three uplink flow. Um, but it also, uh, but the algorithm will also work uh, for downlink or mix the traffic as well. Um, another um, notion is a sub is, is subflow. It means it basically means a segment of flow between two base stations. For example, we have flow one, and it is uh, it it go it go through it goes through link uh, it goes between link one and three and link three and four and four and f four and six respectively. So um, in, on each cycle, on each, uh, as a result of this resort, uh, as a result of the um, airtime allocation, we should see that the rate for each single segment will be will be consistent for a single flow. So next, I want to introduce clique, which is a notion uh, generally used in graph theory. Um, here we mean in a clique means that a um, group of subflows that cannot be active simultaneously. So here we have. Click one and click two highlighted in red dashed lines, red, red dashed circles, and um, click one as we can see that there it mm -hmm. consists of four flow segments, and click two has six flow segments from both flow uh, from all flow uh, from all the flows we shown, and conflict node is a node that is connected to more than one link. So in this simple topology, we have stations three and four as conflict node. Um, want to briefly um, explain rate region because 
I want to use a very simple algorithm to compute actual the airtime allocation for max mean fare. So I I need to prove that max max mean fare allocation act, actually exists in any source of these um, uh, backhole networks. When here, because we consider the kind of a uh, service period allocate a uh, service period kind of channel access, so in a single click, as we know, uh, uh, as we explain here, in a single click, the um, the time allocation will be in a fashion of CD uh, of of TDMA. So the time used by e uh, the time used for each single flow, as a sum uh, the summation of all time used for each. Uh, Flow segment in a click shall not be more than one. It means that the base station a complete node a complete node can only com only talk to one of the neighbor at at a single time. So in each click, the read region is um uh, because it is TMA access, so it is uh, the read region would be con would be convex, and um, because uh, from a network perspective, we have a number of interconnected clicks, so the net region region of the network will be um will be convex as well. Hence, based on previous study, we can say that the mm -hmm. uh, max mean fair resource allocation in the kind of um distrib in the kind of um this backholing networks with the directional antennas and with a, a click notion is exists and it is unique. And we can use a very simple um, algorithm called progressive filling. I will be explaining it here, what progressive filling means. Here we want to take the input of flow demand and link capacities of the of the network. And we will translate this into a kind of in impl impl implications where flow demand uh, j uh, is a kind of constraint that we, would, we don't want to allocate more resource so that the flows actually have a higher rate than its demand because we just want to um, uh, satisfy if it has a if it has a flow demand we just want to satisfy it, and the click time constraint which by by which I mean. The time used used in a single click as a res as a end at by the end of the resource <coughs> allocation shouldn't be more than one. So a uh, couple of uh, figures showing how this uh, progressive filling algorithm actually works. It just more just to give it just to show them in in the image more um, for you to better understanding it. Um, the progressive filling algorithm will start with all flows with zero um, uh, flow with zero rate and then increase all the flows with um, equal steps. Uh, I use 100 but it doesn't have to be 100. Normally we would use a smaller uh, value uh, as a step rate. And then we increase for all the flows um, and until one, of the, uh, until one or more of the flows has met their demand by which, um, uh, by which is shown in the, in, the blue, in the blue bar chart. And because flow one here is being has been um, has met its demand, so we'll stop e increasing its rate, and then we'll uh, keep increasing the rate for flow two and three until, on the right hand side, the time fraction in this click is all is fully used. So flow two and three has a has a has a time allocated for each is zero point three five, and their rate become zero point uh, their rate becomes three hundred and f uh, and f and 50. So at the end of this progressive filling algorithm, we have obtained the um, time allocation for each flow segment and the end-to-end end -end flow rates as shown on the, lab, uh, the graph left in previous slides. So um, by, as we already have this airtime allocation, we want to kind of distribute this in, uh, distribute this in, in, in the network so that each base station knows when to talk to whom. And by um, to do this, we construct we propose a um, hierarchical building uh, hierarchical construct construct uh, construction procedure that we take into consideration three factors. The first is the hop distance from the base station to the gateway, and the second is whether a node is a conflict node, and then the third one is if there is a tie between two stations. To, for which to do, um, for which to do the, to make to make the scheduling decision, we will we will we'll break the tie using <coughs> the ID of the unique uh, unique ID of the uh, of the, of the base station. It's normally the IPv4 or IPv6 address of the base stations. So we all keep using this uh, this very simple topology. And here, because as mentioned, we have this station four and three as um, conflict nodes, and station four has a as a minimum 
has a minimum hop distance to the gateway, so station four will be be the be on the top of the hierarchy and will be assigned airtime first. And then station three is connected to four. It has one hop more to the gateway than station four, and it is connect, uh, and and it, and it has two um, child stations one and four, uh, one and two connected. So station three will be on on the level 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 one, and station one and two will be the next level. So um, we start the uh, scheduling procedure by from uh, from the uh, from the, the top of hierarchy, which is station four. It will assign time using the computed air time in the previous step to station um, three, four, three, five, three, five, and six. And station three, as a at the next level um, coordinator, it will be um, it will accept the time for say sta from station four and assign time for one and two in the next step. So one and two as as a leaf nodes in the network, they will be accepting time from from station three. So that station five and six. Um, here is a very sim uh, a numerical result that we obtained from a single based on the, the very simple topology as well and just want to briefly show you how things gonna how um uh, in this scenario we will i'll be worried uh, i'll be changing the rate of a single link here like um as it often happens in memory, in memory network and to see how this would impact the um the rate allocation for other for other flows in the network so we increase this link. Um, the, the just just briefly explain the settings in the network. We have our um, kind of var uh, varied um, link rates for all the links, and we still have the two clicks. Um, this um, this station four and three will be assigned uh, assi assigned time for uh, assigned time. A comp no, sorry. Um, right. Yeah. And uh, so hi uh, highlight is a uh, is a link rate that we're going to worry, and we have a bunch of res uh, bunch of um, uh, allocation results based on different link rates of link uh, between link one and three. So they start from three hundred and to uh, uh, and to six to, to six uh, to six thousand megabits per second. That will be six gigahertz. So in on both on both on both graphs. I group the uh, I group the values in 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 bunches of bar charts because each of them will each of them will be repre representing a certain value of this this link rate between one and three. So, but um, and yeah, on the on the left hand side it is a throughput graph for flow one, two, and three, and on the right hand side is the airtime allocation for each for each for each for each flow represented in different color. So as the link rates of between one and three increases the throughput, by which I mean the total, the 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 end-to-end -end throughput from station one to six will be increasing. As as it can be transmitting more packets in in the allocated mm -hmm. airtime, and the time it consumed would be would be would be decreasing. So there will be more time in click one for in click one for for flow two to transmit. And as a result, both of these two flows will be will will see an increase in, in throughput and will share the available airtime in click one equally. Um, because they are all uh, they also share a, a number of uh, a portion of resource in click two. They, you will see that um, in click in click two, the airtime allocation actually grows for both flow one and two. And initially, click two is underutilized. But by the time it uh, by the time the link link link, link by the time link one three increases, it, um, it it becomes fully utilized at some point, and more time is allocated to flow one and two, and uh, and flow three has to compensate compensate a little a little bit of the resource. But we see the growth of um, one and two, flow one and flow two in total is actually um, more than. It's actually slightly more than the uh, the compensation made by uh, made by flow three. And um, I've already moved on to from numerical analysis to s simulation, and I built my simulation um, simulation environment in uh, three based on previous um, measurements done carried out by uh, a group of people from Washington U uh, Washington Uni 
they have their um, publication on um, uh, on, 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 uh, on data center networks, but uh, but using multi -giga, gigabit wireless links, which is based on a kind of horn antenna measurements, and it's not the most um, realistic traces, but uh, I think it. it I, I think, uh, but but it's quite reasonable to use it in my in my research because I I kind of assume that the beam forming has already been carried out and the uh, the directional links ha has already formed up in in, in the network. So um, uh, on top on top of this um, measurement on, on top of this um, antenna module, we built our um, eleven AD. Amount, uh, 11 AD kind of um, implementation for the uh, for the Maclear, basically using the uh, using a service service period kind of access uh, access, and then we implement the progressive filling and the hierarchical airtime allocation as mentioned as mentioned before. So here is a, sim a simulation scenario where I I showed this graph previously, but I didn't explain. Um, how the red dots is coming from? It's actually from the open, 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 open data from uh, Notting Nottingham City Council. They have their uh, the geometric information of lamp post, which could be the typical five um, G small cell deployment in the city center area. So these are a couple of uh, the, the red dots showing a couple of um, a couple of. Uh, positions where the um, base station could be employed, uh, base station could be deployed, wh which is also the location of the lamp post. Mm -hmm. So I, in my in, in my simulation, I um, the basically the link rate is decided by the distance from uh, between the two stations. So as as seen in this pro in this in this topology, we have various kind of, we have kind of heterogeneous kind of link rates, and they are represented in different color. And we have one center, um, oh, uh, one center base station which is has a wired connection to the gateway. This is a kind of assumption. Basically, um, I kind of simplify this part in the simulation, so I only have the state, uh, only have the mi minimum wave stations, and I add. Um, there are there are um, fourteen base stations, and we will be allocating eleven flows, aggregated flows to each station. So basically, each each base station will be forwarding or uh, forwarding and um, downloading traffic for the uh, and, and and serving a number of user equipment such as mobile phones. So here we have a click highlight in right in, in red, and in the following results, I'm going to show you um this the um. This clip is going to be constrained so that we will see this bunch of flows have um, um has a click constraint um rate that is uh, that is going to be smaller than the rest, um, and not that this uh, this 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 constra uh, this click constraint flows are actually um from flow zero with index zero to index uh, five. So I run. Here I want to show only very simple results from one UDP experiment and one TCP experiment. They are both having all flows have a demand of 500. So some of the flows can meet their demand, but some cannot because uh, due to the, due to the um, a limited time and limited rate available in the in a single click. So here. For the UDP one, we can see that the um, it is um, I forgot to mention it is a throughput plot for both numerical and uh, and the simulation result, and I want to compare them a little bit. So in the in the, uh, for for each flow, and so the x x axis is flow from zero to ten, and the y axis as throughput in megabits per second megabits per second. So in the UDP, we can see or UDP scenario, we can see that the numerical and simulation. Um, achieve pretty similar behavior, um, but but simulation is again a little bit smaller. One thing is that I reserve a, a portion of time in the scheduled access for beamform training, um, even though I'm not car carrying out beamform training or beamforming and um, in in a simulation. But I want to reserve time, and it is actually specified in the in 1180 protocol as a beacon beacon header interval. So. Um, I think one tenth of the time will be reserved for that, and the, the this small this small difference is also involves um, uh, um also involves the time when because we carry out kind of frame aggregation at the Mac, Mac layer, if if some of you you may know, but 
And for frame aggregation, we normally would um, would kind of aggregate as many as possible. But sometimes because um, it's a, because it is the end of the service period, or because there is some other uh, scenario that we cannot actually achieve the maximum number of frames to send them together. So um, it can be smaller than euro. It will cause a little bit a difference between simulation and the, and the numerical results. For TCP, we see a larger difference. We see um, a slightly larger difference as compared to UDP, and this is because for TCP, first of all, I need to allocate some time for the reverse traffic. By which I mean the the the, the acknowledgement from the from the client to the to back to the server. And on the other hand, the difference is also caused by the. Um, uh, is also caused by the kind of um um. Uh, I can't remember the terminology. Basically, because because UDP will be wait, uh, uh, TCP will be waiting to receive the acknowledgement to increase its congestion window or to uh, to send next the packet. So there is a cost of in, in the round trip time because we are all, we are kind of forwarding the traffic and we are we are acting in a, in a, in, a, in each click a TDM TDMA fashion. So it will cost uh, some time for the t for it will cost a longer RTT and hence. A, small, a smaller rate for, for, for TCP scenario. And we see between TCP results, we even have this difference between, uh, between different flows that they are, um, they are having um, kind of, some of them may have a lower uh, throughput in simulation than numerical, than the, than the other flows. This is because of the hop, hop distance. If we go back to the map, we can see that this flow eight uh, flow eight, nine, and uh, flow eight, nine, and ten has a has a relatively longer hop distance than than the other flow, such as flow six. So we will experience a longer RTT and hence a lower rate in for, for TCP scenario. Uh, and so for now, this is um, a very simple example for me, a uh, very simple si um, simulation example for me to show you. And uh, this work is still ongoing, so I have a couple of points for future, for future plans. First of all, I think it's necessary to test out the mixed traffic type, by which I mean maybe mix UDP and TCP and, and maybe try the realistic and data traces from open data sites such as Crowded. I'm already doing so, but um, I don't have currently any results to show. But um, next point is um, I want to work on uh, the sort of more complex, or maybe some of you may ask me why not try a more complex topology. It, it, it will definitely work with, uh, with a proposed algorithm. It just takes some effort to explain them. And then I want to compare it with um, uh, with the ex ex with existing technology with existing strategies um, I I'm aware that there are a couple of um, uh, kind of distributed airtime allocation for mini wave networks but as far as I'm concerned they are they haven't they haven't explicitly addressed the fairness issue especially between the flows so and um, there is a risk of starving some of the flows or always some airtime allocations so yeah that's pretty much for today. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Could you explain a bit about how your method was actually implemented in, in the nodes? And, and maybe is it a layer two yes. algorithm? Because I didn't really get very clearly, you know, so I, I, get, I get the idea, but I'm not very clear of the specifics of how you actually you know, balancing the pools or whatever. So, you know, so what is your algorithm doing that's different to say a reference implementation? Um, I would say that it is based on the 11AD protocol. Mm -hmm. So we have already 11AD, but 11AD is primary for kind of um, personal area uh, W line where a single a single node is serving a number of base station. Uh, a single node is serving a number of devices. But here we want to explain uh, expand it a little bit and maybe install this kind of um, uh, transceivers on base stations as base stations are ex extend a little bit by implementing this algorithm on the on the Mac layer. So um, also you probably want to consider the practic uh, practical um, aspects where. How the, how this kind of sing, uh, centralized 
algorithm can be distributed or can be like kind of uh, can achieve a kind of coordinated um, transmission uh, coordinated um, allocations in the network. And the way I'm thinking of is that um, use a kind uh, use a SDN and paradigm that is available in the in the networking industry. So yeah. So what you're saying is you have one one base station that's effectively controlled. <coughs> No, one, one, one control entity. One, we have a centralized control entity that will be um, perform the, the, contrib uh, the calculation, the computing, and the distribution. And is that using the same, is that also using the same millimeter wave network to share that information, or is it done on a different channel? I would say it probably have to need the help from um, the traditional frequencies, but only for control, only for like airtime, how to distribute the information. How to actually inform other base stations? This 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 time is allocated to you, mm. and kind of How achieve the coordination. Is it every second or every minute or every and the, What's the, the time scale that you're updating? Uh, the updating. I, I think I would think that it should be um, less than one second. For mean uh, for uh, for eleven AD, we have the beacon interval, which is one hundred milliseconds. And I think that's very reasonable to use uh, overhead to every time to calculate how much, uh, what's the demand of aggregated flow and how much time to be allocated, and so on. So I, I would think 100 milliseconds every every 100 milliseconds would be reasonable. And then what you're doing is dividing up time into slots. So yeah. so, so users are only allowed to transmit in specific time periods and not allowed to transmit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the idea of service period in 11 AD. Yep. So um, <coughs> even with beam time things, you can still have mutual interference. If you looked at uh, strategies for, because you, you choose which ones are allowed to basically uh, consecutive, sorry, uh, transmitted parallel. If you looked at, looked at which ones mutually interfere and try to separate, try to stop them transmitting at the same time, if you looked at those sort of constraints. Um, interference exists in... Yeah, so even if there's two... Is that because of wider beam width or...? Yeah, they can s I mean, because you can still have multipath and sideways and things like that. So you could still have... So if you had two... If you had a cross-function where two, two, um, two different strategies of scheduling came out the same, it might be that one had mutual interference and the other didn't. If you looked at trying to introduce uh, interference constraints into your optimization as well. Not really, because I presumably um, I I'm based on the assumption that beamform training is already down, and the, the in sort of the amount of interference is negligible. I'm not an expert as many of you do in the beamform, but I'm very happy to know more. I mean, I I kind of want to know and um, what would be the beam width that you are talking about? Uh, I can't say All right. Just down here, but it's okay. Fine, but I think that those posts are published. But if it's not if it's not your interest, that's fine. I'm just I was just interested to know okay. whether that was also constrained because of Okay, there is al already a study in on on this on environment on the kind of uh, electronically beam steerable devices. I think they use a velocity board as well. They measure that the the, the amount of interference is very uh, that is it experiencing. It's actually quite small. So I was based on that study, so I didn't really okay. But it's good to know, even. And also, I uh, one problem if if you are interested to know. And um, in my simulation, I was using the horn antenna, which is not ideal. It's not like um, what I was expecting using the electronical uh, antennas. So it, I at some point in my simulation, I experienced some in, uh, secondary interference, meaning that when um, anomalous stations there probably have aligned um, topology, they will be interfered. One of the stations will be interfered by the others. So what I did was to kind of um, produce some um, signal attenuation manually to generate some signal attenuation for the, from those space stations, just to prevent interference from others. And any other any questions? Any other question? Okay, so can we thanks again, Lulu, uh, for the. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.